Welcome back to another episode of The Political Life. Uh, Today, we are very excited to have a new guest, but from a firm that we have heard from before. If the name Bradley Tusk sounds familiar, well, we are going to talk to Chris Coffey. uh, And Chris uh, runs things. Um, He's probably going to correct me on that uh, for Bradley. Bradley um, uh, oversees everything, obviously, and he's been a guest on the podcast uh, twice. We've talked about uh, his work, uh, his charity work, uh, his uh, his book, um, and a lot of other things. And while he's doing all that and creating the vision, um, Chris is the guy um, behind the scenes keeping the trains running on time. And uh, for anyone in the government relations space, uh, is going to be very interested to hear uh, how he does it and what his thoughts are. Uh, so Chris uh, of, of Tusk, um, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what a great, what a great introduction. I appreciate it. Well, it's really, um, I mean, you guys have so much going on. One of the things we're going to have to get to in a little bit is crypto, um, because um, uh, a lot of people are interested in crypto and uh, and what's going on. And New York is kind of ground zero for that. Um, but before we get to that, um, tell me when, how long have you known Bradley? Um, when did you first meet him? Well, I first met Bradley in two thousand. Two or 2003, I worked for Mike Bloomberg. I was his body person and sort of like assistant press secretary type uh, on his first mayoral campaign in 2001. Uh, and when he won, went to City Hall with him. And I think it was late 2002, early 2003, um, he hired Bradley to um, really be a political advisor, but he gave him this task of um, going through all of our campaign promises and figuring out which of the promises he actually kept and which one he hadn't kept and where they were and working with all the city agencies to put out a report, which is really a novel idea. The first time I think a politician has said, here are the thousand campaign promises I made and here's where they are. And Bradley uh, was, you know, I don't know how old he was, but I was only 22 and he's not that much older than I am. He's probably 27 at the time, 28. Um, And he dove into it. I worked with him because I'd worked on the campaign and sort of knew where a lot of the uh, things were. And so then he left uh, and I stayed at City Hall for 11 or 12 years and he went to uh, Illinois to be a deputy governor and uh, and then came back to Bloomberg land in 2009 where he managed the Bloomberg campaign and I was sort of like a chief of staff on the third Bloomberg campaign. And after that campaign, which we won, he um, started test strategies. I went back to City Hall again uh, and joined And what'd you, what'd you do at City Hall? I was all over the place. I mean, I, I was a deputy press secretary. Uh, I was uh, a deputy commissioner of the community affairs unit for a few years, which is sort of the political office, uh, sort of field office, political office. Uh, and in the third term, I was a, I was an assistant film commissioner, which I thought would be a fun job. And I thought, you know, the first seven or eight years with the Bloomberg folks, um, I had really had like a 24-7 job, like a crisis would come up and it would be my life for months. Uh, and so I wanted something that was more thoughtful, more, you know, I, I just met someone and just wanted like a slightly more normal life. And actually bringing film to New York was a fun, you know, we did the Made in New York tax credit. We um, and I still got to do, you know, we created a digital office and a tech office, and I, I got to do sort of some big picture things, which was a lot of fun. And then I joined Bradley in 2012. I think I was employee number four or five, uh, and I sort of, I ran his New York practice, uh, which at the time was about a third of our business, um, and have been here for now 10 or 11 years. I took over CEO of Tusk Strategies, which is the consulting uh, company with about 40 people um, in about a year and a half ago. And the Tusk, um, at, in 2012, he did not have, um, the fund set up at that point, right? Definitely not. No, it was just a small consulting company. Um, he did have the same idea, which is let's not take a million clients. Let's take a few clients, charge them a little bit more, uh, and really run them aggressively. Uh, and that was the thesis for a lot of what else he's done, which is, you know, we're, we're going to, we are going to charge more. We're going to put a lot, we're going to really go all in, treat it like a campaign uh, and sort of be at the nexus between press and lobbying and paid media and social media. 
uh, and grassroots and opposition research and grass tops. So most of our campaigns have some combination. If it only has one, it's probably going to fail. They rarely have all seven, but usually they have like three, four or five of those seven. Um, and there was no one really doing that before. You had lobbying firms, you had PR firms, and you always had these weird, which I never understood. You'd have these weird things. You'd have a lobbying expert and a press expert, and they would really be differential to each other. And I always thought, like, I'm a press guy with a lot of government experience. So, I mean, um, and when I was doing only press, I always wanted to do the lobbying part. When I was doing only lobbying, I always wanted to do the press part. So <laughs> I think they're so integral to each other that um, I never totally understood why you couldn't do both well. And, and others have, have, you know, there's certainly been others that have done that since. Well, that's so, I mean, they're so intertwined. I mean, it's just, so you, you can't separate them. And when they are sep- and when they are at different firms, those firms have to coordinate and be singing from the same page. And as you know, a lot of times that's hard to do because there's competition between them and, and the client's ear and the client's budget. Well, and the other thing is like the press folks are usually, a good press firm, if you're trying to advance legislation that the mayor or the governor, whoever doesn't want, or the city council, whatever the thing is, the press folks want to put attention on the issue, right? Naturally, the press folks want to get attention and move the issue forward. They want the Times or the Daily News or Channel 2 or whoever it is. Um, and the lobbying folks are always going to be very, very weary of that. Those are their relationships. All of a sudden, there's pressure on right. Governor so-and-so to do this thing. And the Governor right. so-and-so is going to call them right. and say, what are you right. doing? You know, and easy, so figuring, yeah, yeah, figuring out the balance right. of those things because – it's if if you're at the stage where you hire us, um, the just tell them approach, which I, I some clients come up with the just tell them approach, which is like we're going to hire these guys, they have a relationship, and just just tell them why they have to do this, or just just tell them why this is in their best interest. And the just tell them approach at the point that they get to us is it doesn't work. Like it, there's some reason right. that just telling them doesn't work. That you have to convince them that you have to get people. Uh, to, you know, fundamentally what Bradley started doing really well, and he did in the Uber campaign uh, when de Blasio tried to ban Ubers, was convince people to go to their legislators. I mean, it's not a super novel idea, but not a lot of folks were doing it. Convince people to go to their legislators and get them riled up. Um, and if you have a city councilman or a state legislature that's all of a sudden getting hundreds of emails from real constituents, Thousands. That's a, that doesn't right. happen, you know? No. Um, so that's not that's not the just tell them approach. It's the let's get everybody else to tell them approach. Um, but it's still amazing how many times a client who just wants to pay and say, no, 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 but we have the best argument and you just have to tell them. Uh, and that, you know, the, I think the days of doing that are fairly behind us. It's like when a client tells you that it's 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 um, we need to make it clear that it's unconstitutional, right? It's like you what? Know, you know, I'm saying we just need to make if you're it clear. arguing the Constitution, you clearly have lost. <laughs> yeah, we just need to make it more clear. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, and that was, and then Bradley decided in 2020, or I, I ran Andrew Yang's mayoral campaign. God help us, which was I'm in therapy for, but. Um, in New York. And after that, the campaign ended in July of 21. And Bradley decided around then that he was done managing and running Tusk Strategies. And he, you know, he really doesn't at all anymore. I mean, he fo- he focuses on his venture fund. He focuses on his foundation. He focuses on, he's got a bookstore. He's writing a book. Um, but he's pretty, you know, he, he's very hands off for, unless I, you know, if I need something and I want advice, which I do all the time, I'll ask him advice, but he's not like, going to client meetings, let's say. And when you, when, when he started the firm and you joined him shortly thereafter, um, it was not just focused on New York. It was a 50 state. It was, it was clients having problems anywhere in the country, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the idea was that we could, um, that if you knew how to really run a campaign, you could run a campaign anywhere. And, um, you put together the right lobbying team, you, you put together the right press team, uh, you, you have the right tactics and that, that formula will work in other places. I have to say, I focused on New York and New Jersey. Um, and I, and Bradley would say to me occasionally, like, why do you just want to do that? Like, don't you want to do, it's like, that's the part that I liked to do because I liked knowing the answer. So if you know that, if you know the places and you know, the people, you know, the reporters, you know, the legislators, you know, the governor, whoever you need to know, then when the client says to you, what do you think the answer is? 
you're not guessing the answer based on like what it should be, but you know the answer because you know all the people involved and you know, and you and you know what the answer. You know what the Times is going to say. You know what the Daily News is going to say. You know what the governor's going to say. Like you, you just know it. Um, and the downside of doing it in California. And by the way, now I know California a lot better, so maybe now I know I know the answer there too. But it is hard to know 50 states, so you're more reliant on either your staff. Uh, or on folks that you work with on the ground. We have really great relationships with a couple of lobbyists that we have, uh, and you just come to trust them, and you know, and and that goes for other folks too. So, you know, I think about a third of our business back then was New York, and if I had to guess, it, you know, if you count crypto, it's a little higher now. It's probably closer to forty or fifty percent. But I almost count the crypto. We have a crypto practice that is almost distinct. It works in New York. But it's not like the old, like, oh, we got to pass this bill through the legislature and everyone's got to be all hands on deck. I always treat those as two separate things. We have a New York practice and we have a crypto practice. And and so about 40% of your work now is New York focused? Well, if you add crypto, I, I, I you know, I, oh, okay. I so, some of the crypto work is not in New York. Some of it is DC or just P, comms for crypto or thought leadership for crypto. Um, but if you added the New York practice with the crypto practice, it's probably about 40%. Okay. So tell us about crypto. What is going on with crypto? Um, and New York is kind of leading the charge, uh, which makes sense. And, and kind of all eyes are on you. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. Bradley, uh, a, a bunch of years ago, we, we had, we actually had someone who worked for us before, you know, in 2015 and 16, who, said like crypto is going to be you know the next it's it's the thing and this was a this was a while ago uh and i spent a lot of time not listening to him and blowing him off uh, but we started you know sort of dipping our toe in the water of crypto um back then it was more about you know sort of comms and other ways to help by 2019 uh, and 20 and then 21 um, it was clear that the way, you know, the, the, the way to get the, the, the gold standard for crypto companies is to be regulated by the New York State Department of Financial Services. Um, and we had run some non-crypto campaigns around getting DFS uh, to take a look. Uh, and, and, you know, in previous administrations, um, you know, DFS is a sprawling agency that has a lot. People don't know. I mean, it has tons of authority. I think thousands of people that work there, and insurance, and banking, and crypto, and all these other things. Um, and so, especially in the previous administration, there were just crypto companies sort of piling up on top of each other, and not enough people at DFS to approve them, to go through the paperwork, uh, to really have a process in place. All of that has gotten a lot better. Um, leaps and bounds better in this administration where they've added a bunch of people. Adrian Harris is the superintendent and she's added, I don't know, like dozens and dozens of people that now do this work. Um, and at some point we started uh, really developing an expertise and hiring people that could go through the applications and do the regulatory work that's required. Um, there's obviously always political work of, of touting the industry and doing op-eds from lawmakers and having third parties, you know, check in with the governor about to make sure she's taking crypto seriously as an industry. Um, and we think we've done that really well. Uh, and we've, um, you know, the industry has obviously gotten hit hard these last six months, but we still have uh, a whole bunch of crypto clients who come to us for advice, either about the SEC where we have a big DC office or DFS or just sort of general like thought leadership advice. I think DFS has given out a couple of bit licenses, which is the the license that allows you to be regulated in New York, one of the licenses. Um, and I think in this administration, like we've gotten, they've only done a few and we just, Itero just got licensed like last week and we have another company called Apex, which got licensed six months ago. So we think we've, you know, um, have spent the time investing in the resources here at Tusk to be able to go through those applications, understand it and develop a trust with the folks at DFS. Um, there's, there's been folks we've turned down, uh, because we've thought, um, they're not, they're not doing the paperwork and they're, they're, they're not taking compliance seriously enough. And so we've, we've, we've had to turn them down and we need to be able to go to DFS with a level that they will, that they'll, you know, sometimes trust that we're not taking just anybody. Okay. So many questions I've got to ask you. Um, 
and so tell us um, a little bit about. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, your your crypto practice is in, in uh, just top notch. Tell us about um, what you can about eToro. That's uh, that's exciting news. Yeah, I mean, eToro worked with us for over a year. They're an Israeli company that was looking for their bit license. Um, Eric Sufer, who runs the fintech practice, uh, really spent a ton of time uh, developing. You know, I mean. What often happens, and I don't want to, I wasn't involved in the early part of eToro, so I don't want to, I don't, you know, but but what often happens, and I have seen this before, is you have a company that has been going back and forth, especially in the last iteration of DFS before before this administration, where they there's back and forth for six months. They don't really understand DFS. And so they come to you and they say, we're really, really close. We've been talking to them for six months. We think we just need a little push and we're there. And then you go to DFS and say, hey, I've got these folks, you know, and they say, who? Like, we don't know those folks, you know, or, or we do, but, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not where they think they are. They haven't done X, Y, and Z. They haven't done. Uh, and so, you know, D D DFS is, um, again, has really added resources. They've added all these processes. And so a lot of this stuff has just gotten leaps and bounds better. Um, and we've, you know, spent a lot of time working with them and, and hearing what they're doing so that we can give better advice to clients about how to move things forward. So eToro over the last year has really, really added on their compliance work, has been meeting all the time with DFS to try to um, be the gold standard. Uh, and, and we're finally licensed this week after a little bit more than a year. Uh, but they really, you know, it, it was really nice to see it come together. The folks um, had a deep appreciation for the work that TFS was doing. And what does that mean for them business-wise, getting that that license from New York? Well, it allows them to operate in New York. I mean, you know, New York really is the regulatory gold standard. Um, and there's actually this brewing fight in D.C. where D.C. is trying, you know, the SEC is trying to um, – take away states authorities to regulate crypto and in a lot of states that that would work because they're really not they're really not doing it but new york has i think you could ask anyone in crypto anyone or a crypto company new york has the most intense process and it really is the gold standard it's where a lot of these folks are based uh and so if 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 they took it away it would be a massive blow especially to all the companies that have gone through the years and years of effort to have one to work on that relationship and to be regulated properly I mean, people forget, um, you know, FTX wasn't licensed in New York. There was no, they didn't have a New York uh, trust. And I don't, I'm not saying that if they had, they would have been ahead of that. I, I don't know, but it's certainly possible. Um, and there have been all these times over the last six months where because a company was regulated, we avoided just that, just that with, with unhappy customers who've lost thousands, millions, whatever dollars. Um, so, you know, eToro will be, and, and, and people shouldn't, you know, even through this period, DFS has been doing the work of getting, li getting licenses out and getting people, um, just doing it with the, um, consumers in mind. And you mentioned, um, kind of the vetting process. Um, it, it, it seems as if your vetting process, like most firms, when a, when a client comes in are not doing too much of a vetting process, it's pretty much, you know, what can you pay and will they pay? Um, your, your vetting process is, is, is fairly thorough. You, you turn away potential clients. Yeah. I mean, we, we just, I, I also would distinguish a little bit between crypto and non-crypto. Um, the crypto world. I mean, I was actually, I was actually just sorry to interrupt you. I was just talking in general. Cause I know when I've yeah. talked to Bradley before, you all have quite a, a vetting process. Yeah, we oh, vet people. We, we don't want to work with folks that are scumbags. Uh, and we don't want to work with folks that um, are going to be. And, and there have been times where we've sort of been on the fence and decided to just move forward because the company's a reputable company. And so the guy that we're or the person we're dealing with, it's a little bit, you know, and we always regret it, like always inevitably regret it. So um, and then with crypto work. You know, we have a bunch of crypto clients. You're, you're you're talking and working with DFS with all of these good actors. If you have a really shitty actor, excuse my language, in there, it's going to mess up the other stuff. Like it 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 is because they're going to be upset with you. It's going to lower their judgment in the good companies that you're working with. Um, so we've turned down. I mean, 
we've turned down a bunch. I mean, we yeah, we turned down the FTX. So so you it's so for, it's a little bit instance, like the Charlie. <laughs> oh, you turn them down. We turn them down on a on a project. It was actually not a New York regulatory project, but we we did not get to we we turn them down. Yes. So it's a little bit like the Charlie Munger when he's looking at an investment. You look at the individual, the quality of the individual. You look at the business model, whether or not you believe in it. You look at the regulatory hurdles that they're facing. You probably look at the upside, um, but you kind of look at the whole picture before you decide whether or not to um, to work with them. Yeah, and I would add, can we can we win? Because if you if you only work <laughs> okay. for, if you only work for folks that lose. Yeah. Um, it's going to make other folks less likely to go to you because you're always working for a loser. So, um, and I don't want to take someone's money if we're not going to be successful. So that doesn't if mean you know that, you're you not know. going to win. Yep. Yeah. And so our, again, our fees are usually higher than other firms because of our model. And so oftentimes when they, when the client gets to you, they've tried the easier way first and it hasn't worked. So there are times where they get to you and you just look at it and you know, it's not going to work. You know, you're fundamentally the governor or whoever it is, uh, is never going to do what you're asking them to do. Uh, and your legal strategy doesn't make any sense. And your comp strategy doesn't make any sense. And the underlying thing is a problem. And then you have to either be, I mean, there have been times where you've been honest with them and say, this isn't going to work, but if you want us to take it, I'll take it. Like you seem lovely. So if you want me to take it, but it's not going to work. And sometimes they say yes. And sometimes they say no. And what percentage of your, uh, clients on the consulting side, are also um, uh, you're invested in on the on the fund side. I think zero. I think we now have a total oh. separation between the two places. There, there. We we have a couple of companies that um, that we provide services for that pay us in equity, and they'll pro- they'll pay us in cash and some equity, and the equity goes into a pool for our employees. Uh, but it's usually a fairly small percentage of the overall thing, 20 percent or something like that. Um, now, there's Bradley has another company called Pericles that only does uh, smaller stage, earlier stage companies and pays entirely in equity. Uh, and so there's I don't know five or six people that are doing that, and then he has the fund as well. Um, the fund does have investments in folks that we have worked with on the consulting side before, but there's nobody at this moment that we've invested in. All right. So let's go back. There's, there's two topics we kind of skimmed over. Um, Chris, we could probably talk to you all morning. Um, but that I want to, I, I know our listeners are going to want to hear about, and, and, and I know you're probably <laughs> don't, don't want to talk about it. You're probably, you said you're in therapy or whatever, but is the, uh, Andrew Yang, uh, mayoral campaign and also what it was like to work, uh, in City Hall, particularly for a um, such a dynamic mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. I mean, both sure. of those experiences had to be just incredible. Uh, why don't we start with um, the, the the mayor's the, the 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 Yang campaign first, and then we'll get through that. And yeah, I mean, we have a rule that we didn't follow that was like we're not doing any more candidates. We'll ca- we'll occasionally do independent expenditures or super PACs, uh, but running a candidate's campaign. Um, you generally get paid less and they have a much higher expectation of your time and services. Um, and, it, and it inevitably means that the rest of your business suffers because you're spending all of your time on this one thing. But, but we have to go back to where we were, which was in October uh, and September of 2020. Uh, we were in a pandemic. The city was shut down. Um, folks did not know whether the city was going to recover. Uh, and the field of, and by the way, I had, I mean, not to get too in the weeds, but I had run Corey Johnson, who is the speaker of the city council. I had run his campaign for speaker of the city council in 2017. He was widely thought to be a front runner, the front runner for mayor in 2021. Um, at some point that fall of 2020, he decided I'm not going to run. He had some mental health issues that he's talked about publicly um, and decided he wasn't running for mayor. Um, and so there we were like sort of planning on, at least I was planning on having a big role in Corey's mayoral campaign. And all of a sudden it was September, October of 2020 city shut down. The economy's in the tank. People are still remote. Um, Corey had dropped out. Uh, and we get this phone call out of the blue saying, can you talk to Andrew Yang? He's thinking about running for mayor. Um, and so Bradley and I talked to Andrew several times, 
Bradley's inclination, which was probably the right inclination, was yeah, we should do his independent expenditure, and like we can fig- we can give him some advice about who he can talk to about hiring, but like we're not going to run his mayor's race. And I was just in this place where like I had been here, I wasn't CEO yet, I'd been here for nine years. Um, I really have a deep belief. I grew up in New York. I my mom was Ed Koch's chief of staff for twelve years. I like very passionately care about New York City and its governance and its health. Um, and I thought Andrew um, could win. Uh, there were a couple of candidates who were running who um, I didn't think that highly of. Um, I didn't know Eric Adams, but didn't think he was going to. I didn't. I just. Um, he, he wasn't one of the people that I didn't think highly of, but the people that were getting a lot of the buzz in October of 2020 were people that I didn't think that highly of. Um, and there was Andrew, this like dynamic, you know, rock star type candidate who is getting press everywhere. And you could see how his appeal might work in New York. So we talked to him a few times over the fall. Um, I didn't think he was actually going to run. Uh, and he came back to us in... December of 2020 and said, I want to run. And you, but the only way I'm going to run is if you manage the campaign or if you, you work on the campaign. Um, and so Bradley and I talked about it and decided to do it. Wow. He and didn't how do long? It. I mean, he, he was, Bradley was an advisor, but Bradley wasn't running the campaign. He, that was part of the deal. He didn't want to run the campaign, but and, I said, I would basically run it. Um, there was actually another guy running it briefly who was a Yang, presidential guy um and then i took over i think in january of of 21 and how long did you work on that the campaign we was i mean it was a short campaign we announced in january of uh 21 and the primary was june 22nd 21 so it was six months but if you count december it was really seven seven or eight months uh i did it with a colleague Uh, the two of us were co-campaign managers uh, we sort of split up responsibilities on the campaign. I did sort of politics and comms and some fundraising, and she did field and sort of operations and policy. Um, and yeah. So would you do it again? No. Well, Ooh, so to some hesitation tra- there. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it was a good experience not just for me, but for all the people who worked for me. I mean, everyone, you know, anyone who worked on quote, the New York team at Tusk at that point of which many of the folks are still here worked on the campaign and really went all in, whether that's on the press side or the policy side or the kind of operations or field or any of those things. And they learned a ton. Um, and I think it was probably good for people's profile, including my own, um, just in a transition to Mike Bloomberg. I mean, Mike, I was around Mike when he was running in 2001 I was an intern at the company, and then I became his body person. Mike took, and Mike was in the civic space. He was on boards. He was in New York. His company was here. Mike took like a year of classes, budget, uh, finance, uh, like what is what is the cultural, you know, what is the police, what is you know, sort of. He Mike took a year of class of experts coming in, you know, a couple times a week and briefing him on city government. And so by the time Mike ran. A year later, in 2001, he was pretty well versed. He wasn't an expert in everything, but he he had a baseline. Andrew Yang did not have that baseline, and it wasn't his fault. He had never given one minute of thought to running for mayor. He lived here, but he wasn't in the civic life like Mike Bloomberg was or like some of these other candidates who just know a lot about the civic life. Andrew was focused nationally. He was focused on his business. He was focused on presidential politics. And so there were just things that he didn't know. And because he decided to run so late, he didn't have the year to do like, what do you do about Rikers Island? And what do you do about this? And what do you, you know, what do you do about the city budget? What do you do about cops? And, and I would also say that while the pandemic was the prime topic, Andrew was light years ahead of anyone. He, he would go, but, but when we got into the race, everybody else was campaigning on Zoom. Every event was on Zoom. And Andrew was like, I'm not going to campaign on Zoom. So he was out like in the streets with people in Brown in, in Brownsville and uh, Bed-Stuy. In, and he was a rock star. And there was a sense then that we really needed someone to get the city like open. Um, and while the pandemic was the number one issue, Andrew was like 25 points ahead of everyone else. Um, and then the attacks, the legitimate attacks started coming. Uh, and it really did damage. Uh, and so, you know, the times of this big story about 
his work as CEO. And um, he made some sort of gaffes about not knowing. It was clear that he didn't know certain city things. He didn't know what 50A meant. If you're in the space, you have to know 50A. Um, and those attacks uh, did a lot of damage to him. Um, and and by the way, at the same time, crime was becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. People were getting shot. There was a terrible 10-year-old tragedy. A 10-year-old got shot in the Rockaways. There was someone who got killed in Times Square. And there was a former cop who uh, was the borough president and, and uh, people looked to on crime. And as crime became a bigger and bigger issue, uh, Eric Adams' poll numbers went further and further up. And to his credit, he spoke to what people wanted to speak about so that by May and June, uh, people wanted to talk about crime and he was talking about crime. And by the way, had been very consistently since the beginning. He didn't, Eric Adams didn't start talking about crime in May. He was talking about crime in December uh, or whenever before. Who did the uh, Times end up endorsing? Do you remember? Yeah, of course. Well, it, it, yes. I still, I can, I can give you who the Queen's Chronicle endorsed if you want. Uh, the, <laughs> the Times endorsed Catherine Garcia. Uh, you know, there had been rumors that they were thinking of endorsing Scott Stringer, who had uh, a problem when uh, two women accused him of sexual uh, issues uh, and assaults. I think one of them was, I think they were both assaults. Um, and Catherine Garcia had been polling very, very low, uh, but everyone thought she was really, really smart and knew how to manage the government. And the Times took a big leap and endorsed her. And by the way, she came 7,000 votes away from winning. When the Times endorsed her, um, other people really, it really validated her. And if you look at where she got her votes, it, it was a very polarizing election in some way. I mean, people don't, you know, Cobble Hill and Brooklyn Heights and the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side and sort of white, you know, white affluential folks voted for Catherine Garcia. Uh, and there were, and, and certainly ranked choice, you know, a lot of those folks voted for Eric also, but they voted for Catherine first, they voted for Eric second. Um, Eric won a lot of black votes and then much and, and sort of more moderate white votes, Staten Island, parts of Brooklyn. Um, all right. Shifting gears, um, the city hall, what is it like working in city hall? Um, uh, and particularly for that mayor, mayor Bloomberg. Yeah. I mean, I, so I was his body person. I traveled with him. I, um, you know, we did that, that had to I be was, just, that had to be just, um, just, I mean, you were how old when you first started doing that? Like 22? I was 21. I was 21 on his first campaign. Wow. Uh, and I finished at 32, I guess, or 33. Um, you know, I also, the problem is I didn't know anything, but I didn't know that I didn't know anything. So <laughs> right, if right. I, if I had, you know, I was in these moments <laughs> where, space. yeah, where like all of these things were happening. I was going to all these places. I was learning all this stuff. Um, and it was all amazing. It was right after 9-11. You know, I, I was with Mike when uh, the towers fell. He had just voted. It was a primary day. Mm. Uh, and obviously that totally changed. He was down 30 points heading into primary day. He was he was going to win the primary but lose lose the general. Um, and 9-11 totally changed the race. It became a race about, you know, who, who was more competent to build New York City back. Uh, and Mike won it by 30,000 votes uh, in November of, 20, of 2001. Um, but I just like, you know, I wasn't mature enough to appreciate how big of a deal it was to work at City Hall every day after 9-11 and work for this sort of non-politician politician. Uh, and I had these moments like, you know, I was I, I, I went to Haiti for him right before uh, the 150th anniversary. And there was a coup in Haiti while I was there. <laughs> and I had to let like flown out of Haiti in like a helicopter and, and to like... I, I think we had to call Mike to tell him he couldn't come because Aristide was like in the back of a car in 2004. And there were just these like, and I went to Israel a bunch of times, which is amazing after like a bus bombing in Israel. And um, when Ariel Sharon had a stroke, I had to go and like, I spent like a week like locked in the King David Hotel with like President Bush's advance team. You're just in these moments um, that, are once in a lifetime moments, but you don't really know that because you're too young to really understand that this probably won't happen again. Um, and the only other example I have, I mean, I have plenty of others, but the day after Mike won, and again, even going into election day, he was not supposed to win. Maybe by election day, it was a toss up, but the weekend of the election, uh, he was down, you know, he, I think the, the, the daily news, the Sunday of the daily news before the election on a Tuesday was like 50, 50. 
Um, and he had been down, you know, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And all of a sudden we did a 24 hour bus tour with then popular and normal Rudy Giuliani, um, or more normal, uh, and John McCain. And we did this, like he was bowling at two o'clock in the morning and we go into election day and I didn't think we were going to win. I mean, I didn't really know, but I just assumed I never thought we were going to win to Mike's credit. I think he thought we were going to win. I don't think anybody else thought we were going to win. Um, and election night, it was over early. I mean, we were getting the results in from the cops and the precincts are calling in the results. And even when Mark Green was still ahead, you could see the TVs cut away. and He's walking down the stairs to concede because they had already told him Staten Island wasn't in. And once Staten Island was in, like it was he was going to lose badly. Um, and so Mike had had this. I'm going to take this full circle to Bradley. Mike had had this bet during the campaign. It wasn't a bet. He ran into this guy, Tony uh tony tony salamanca tony santa maria tony santa maria in in diker heights and while he was campaigning one day he said all you politicians are the same you're going to be here now and you're never going to come back you're asking for my vote i'm never going to see you again and mike said win or lose at 7 30 in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning the day after the election i'm going to be back and at this point he was 35 points down and like it sort of became a running joke on the campaign because he would say to us, like, who's going to be with me the next morning? And we would be like, not me. The race is over. So, like, you know, we figured it would be him and his Bloomberg driver and they would go and that would be the end of it. Um, and he would make this joke to me because I was with him so much as his sort of advanced person, body person, advanced person. He would be like, hey, am I going to see you the day after the election? And I'd be like, sure. Yeah. Um, so he wins and he walks across the street to make this big speech and he sees me and he says, so tomorrow morning, like 630, right? And I was like, yeah, right, sure. So the next morning at 630, I'm out in Diker Heights, you know, and again, it's after 9-11. So there are 50 TV cameras there. There's like Savannah Guthrie is hosting the Today Show from there. It's like, it's like insanity. There are more cops than I've ever seen. Everyone's trying to figure out if this guy is going to show up. Uh, and I'm out there. And meanwhile, like his press secretary, everyone had overslept because they were all out till four in the morning. And so it's just like Mike Bloomberg on his way to see me with like, I'm 22. I just turned 22. There are like 3000 TV cameras. And I'm on the phone with different people saying like, what do I do? Do I do these live shows? Do I do Savannah Guthrie? Like, I don't know what to do. And by the way, is fucking Anthony Santa Maria going to show up? And so uh, like two minutes after Mike gets there, you can see the cops sort of clear the way. And there's this old guy, Anthony Santa Maria, who walks up as they're like live on the Today Show. And that became a really special relationship that Mike had. And by the way, when Bradley was doing the campaign promises, he brought Anthony Santa Maria back as like a symbol of like campaign promises kept. Um, and I remember that morning going with Mike as like President Bush called to congratulate him and President Clinton called and Hillary Clinton called and all these people. And I'm like juggling the calls as he's on his way to the Bronx, like putting world leaders on the phone with him. It's a really special time. And I think, you know, again, I was 22. So you don't really understand how big of a deal it is. You just think, you know, you're just in your like you're in your element. But looking back on it, um, it's 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 pretty amazing stuff. And what and you spent so much time uh with Mayor Bloomberg, and he has had two incredibly successful careers. Um, what, um, you know, did you, you know, in those moments when you're riding around, what would you say is different um, about him um, or or special about him that you think helped him um, or made him a little bit different um, than the average person? Well, he just wanted to do the right thing and um, and didn't seem to care about the politics. And as someone who was more political, especially later, I mean, I was just when I was 22, I was 22. But later on in the, in the second and third term, I was much more political. And as someone who was advising sometimes on politics, that could be frustrating because you would say, no, 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 you can't do this. Like people are going to hate it. And he would say, but like the right thing to do. So, of course, we're going to do it. Often he was rewarded for that. You know, he raised taxes in 2002. He banned smoking in 2002. Both of those things were deeply unpopular at the time. But by the time he ran again in 2005, the city was healthy economically. He had sent people rebate checks. The smoking ban was popular. Um, he had started building, you know, I'm now the chairman of Brooklyn Bridge Park. He started that in 2002. He started the High Line. 
Um, you know, uh, Hudson River Park was built up again. So he was doing these big, big projects, uh, and he was making early decisions that were tough decisions, hoping that they would pay off. But even if they weren't, he would say, well, I did the right thing. Um, and now, you know, 20 years later, I spend a ton of time with electeds, some of whom are great, but they don't, they're not like, you know, they're not like that. <laughs> you know, they're like, but what about me? How does it affect me? What about me? It's very like me, me, me. And Mike, you know, every elected I've ever met has a huge ego. Um, Mike was no exception to that. Um, but but he, al- he, he ultimately always chose to do the right thing. And, and then, and what about his personal habits? I mean, clearly he has an incredible work ethic. Um, uh, was there anything else that kind of makes him stand apart that you, that you saw? I mean, obviously the work ethic would probably be the top thing. Yeah. I mean, Mike was at work every day at six 30 or something, six or six 30. And he was doing like the stairmaster before that or whatever he was doing. And, you know, the, the mayor of New York gets guarded by, many police officers, New York City police officers. And I remember early on in his first year, he came outside of his, he he didn't move to Gracie Mansion, which is where mayors live. He was in his brownstone on 79th Street. And he came outside at 615 to be picked up by his cops and go to City Hall. So he walks outside at 615. The cops aren't there yet. They were still at Gracie Mansion. He was was probably a few minutes early and they were probably a few minutes late. So he held a cab. And like jumped into a cab and the, cop, the cops got there. I think there was a there was a there was a police officer in uniform who's always in front of his brownstone who, who didn't know what to do. Some kid jumps in the car with him because like, God, he doesn't want to lose the mayor. So now the, the cop and the, the cop and the mayor are in the car and then his car is, you know, his security detail pulls up at 630 when they're supposed to pull up. Always be early. I was an advanced guy. Always be early. Mike was always early everywhere. So if, if I was normally an hour early, I would try to be an hour and a half early because like. He would show up a half an hour early, and if you had just showed up, then you don't know anything, and you can't figure out how to get him in and out of places. Um, but his police details showed up, and we're like, "Wait, what? Where's the Where's the cop? Where's the guy at the desk? He's gone." And like, "Where's the mayor?" Uh, they probably—I mean, I've, I'm sure they had a panic attack. That was probably the last time they were ever late. Uh, but he, you know, he took the subway. Every, he took the subway every day. I, he he didn't take the subway that day because he was going to Gracie Mansion, and there's no subway to Gracie Mansion. But if he had been going to City Hall, he would have walked over and jumped on the subway, and that's how he got around. Uh, and I, you know, I remember early on in his first term, and I'll, this is my last story about Mike Bloomberg. But um, you know, I was an advanced guy. He he was throwing out the first pitch at Cyclone Field, uh, which is the minor league Mets in, in Coney Island. Uh, and I, I was a little bit late because of traffic on the BQE and the cops were there and they said, oh, he's going to land right here. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, he's coming from this thing and he's in a helicopter and he's going to land in the bullpen. And I was like, what? Mike Bloomberg's going to land in the fucking bullpen? Like, of course he's not going to do that. He's going to go crazy. And they were very, you know, I was young. The cops were very, especially at first, like, we are in charge of security. You are, this kid is not going to tell us how to run security. Um, and I said to them, guys, like, why would you mm-hmm. think, why would you think Mike Bloomberg would want to land in the bullpen in the middle of this game or at the beginning of the game? And they said, well, Rudy, you know, this is, this is, we've done this for a hundred years. Like Rudy landed in the bullpen, Ed Koch landed in the bullpen, everyone lands in the bullpen. So I was like, uh, this is a good lesson for me too. I was like, uh, okay guys, like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I wouldn't do that. If I, I know, you know, my value that I was bringing that they didn't have is that I knew Mike really well. By this point, I'd spent a year in a car with him traveling around and Mike Bloomberg landing in a, in a bullpen with people watching in a helicopter would be like, it would be like a kiss of death. So I said to them, I wouldn't do that. What I couldn't do was call them because they were in the helicopter. So I, I gave very, I also have come to realize, I don't think they had the cars. If he didn't land in the helicopter, if he didn't land there, the closest field was, you know, 15 minutes away, but they didn't have cars to get him there, I think, because they were very dismissive of me. Mike Bloomberg, who never yelled, I mean, he was, he would only yell if, 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 he, if he really deserved it. And he gets out of the helicopter and he was as angry as I, I, I almost think he was as angry as I've ever seen anybody. And he was angry at me, by the way. He wasn't angry at the cops. He was angry at me for letting him. He thought, yeah, yeah he thought I mean, you. Yeah. He, even though I said, <laughs> and by the way, there, he's screaming at me, rightfully. It is on me. I should have said to them, no, 
Um, and I didn't. And partially I was late and they were older and they were cops and whatever, whatever the dynamics were. Um, of course, he's screaming at me and the cops are standing there. The right thing to do would be for the cops to jump in and be like, hey, it wasn't him. He said we shouldn't do it. It was on us. But the cops were like, oh, no fucking touching that. <laughs> he is screaming at me. And I and I did not say, hey, I didn't want you to land here. I just kind of like rolled with it. Um, and it was a whole kerfuffle. Like I had to talk to people afterwards and I knew that he shouldn't land there. He doesn't want to land in the bullpen, like in front of all these people. That's not the kind of mayor he is. No. Um, you know, he wouldn't even let someone carry his briefcase. He wanted to carry his own briefcase. So, you know, uh, but that was a good lesson. And by the way, he never landed in the bullpen again. And the cops got the, I think the cops did get the lesson. They got in a bunch of trouble for it. Uh, but you know, uh, so anyway, there you go. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, uh, shifting back to Tusk Strategies. Um, um, sure. What's the next, uh, as you look kind of the year ahead, what's besides crypto, what's kind of new um, new technology, uh, new companies that are keeping you busy, or what do you see kind of popping up, if anything? Well, we're doing a lot of cannabis work around the country. Mm. I don't know if that's, that's not new. Um, you know, I would like psychedelics, uh, psychedelics, you know, Bradley's a big psychedelics, a believer that there's a regulatory market that we should be more, we should be more involved in. So maybe, um, I actually think for me personally, we opened a DC office last year that has been phenomenal. We, we hired, uh, Cristobal Alex, who is a senior Biden person to run it. We'll hire more DC people. We have an LA office now with six people in it that we never had before. We hired someone in Albany who is who is um, Majority Leader Andre Stewart Cousins, longtime chief of staff. Her name is Chantel Smith. She's been amazing. I think making these kind of big hires that really bring in their own business, their own reputation, their own gravitas, and allows us to be a little bit more national. So I could see doing that, hiring a pollster and starting a polling practice, or um, or really adding to our DC. Uh, lobbying capabilities or you know we have this la office with five or six people in it now six people um but we don't have like a ton of sacramento lobbying experience so i could see hiring a real ace in sacramento i i, I think we'll do something i mean the, you know bradley as you know does not like to sort of sit back and just like take our take, take our winnings and go home he wants to keep pushing the boundaries um and i do too i think that's the fun part uh, if we just did what we did last year it wouldn't be as fun. So like, what are the fun new things that we can do uh, to push the envelope? And so that's what we're, we're, we're focused on. Well, Chris, it's been great to have you on. Uh, we very much appreciate the time um, and great to hear about Tusk strategies and, and, and your career. Um, and uh, we will have to circle back with you um, uh, later in the year uh, just to touch base again. Maybe we'll do it. We'll do it live in the, uh, in the bookstore at the podcast uh, studio that you have. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to do it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. And for our listeners out there, remember, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and you can sign up for our email at politicallife.net. We hope you all have a wonderful and safe week.